Perfect. Cool. Uh, Christine, Todd, um, I'll go through a reading of the Linux Foundation Antitrust Policy very briefly, then I will handle it up to you to have the meeting. Linux Foundation meetings involve participation by industry competitors, and it's the intention of the Linux Foundation to conduct all of its activities in accordance with applicable antitrust and competition laws. It is therefore extremely important that attendees adhere to meeting agendas and be aware of and not participate in any activities that are prohibited under applicable US state, federal, or foreign antitrust and competition laws. Examples of types of actions that are prohibited at the Linux Foundation meetings and in connection with the Linux Foundation activities are described in the Linux Foundation Antitrust Policy. If you have questions about these matters, please contact your company counsel, or if you're a member of the Linux Foundation, feel free to contact Andrea Optogrove of the firm of Gessner Optogrove LLP, which provides legal counsel to the Linux Foundation. Hyperledger is committed to creating a safe and welcoming community for all. For more information, please visit our Hyperledger Code of Conduct. It's perfect. Glad to have you both here, Todd and Christine. It's, uh, it's an honor for me to, to hear from you today. And very quickly, I would love to, to listen to for you and Todd. Who wants to start Perfect. first? Will it be you, Christine? Yes, I will kick us off. Thank you, Andre. I appreciate it. You're Thank welcome. you for having us here today. Um, I'm Kristen Mashad. Um, I'm the head of Inblock for LiquidX. Um, just quick kind of background on my background. I, I grew up in a non-traditional space in corporate America. So 10 years at IBM, 10 years at GE um, in treasury and financial systems roles. Came over to LiquidX about two years ago to build out an amazing platform called Inblock, and we'll talk about that today. It's our platform that runs on um, the distributed ledger technology. And Todd, I'll let you introduce yourself. Great, <clears throat> great, thank you, Kristen. My name is Todd Linity, and I've been with LiquidX for about a year and a half. And similar to Kristen, I came from the world of the incumbent. I worked for um, a trade as trade credit insurance, which is the second largest trade credit insurance uh, company globally. I worked for uh, Zurich Insurance, and I also worked with uh, Euler Hermes, who is an Allianz company, which is the largest trade credit insurance um, company in the world. And in between, I also worked for two commercial finance companies, uh, GE Capital. Uh, Chris and I actually overlapped a little bit there, as well as Textron Financial. So uh, my background comes from the large corporate incumbents now to the fintech and sure tech space, which has been a quite exciting uh, evolution for me personally, but also professionally. So looking forward to speaking with everybody today. Awesome. So I would encourage if um, folks have questions too, I know Andre is gonna ask us some questions as well at the end, but um, if you have any questions, feel free to enter them in the chat. We'd love this to be more interactive as well. Um, we're gonna take you through kind of what our, our company does, um, why the distributed ledger technology, a practical use case around it. And we hope it's um, kind of uh, interesting for you all and that there's that interaction on questions. <laughs> So just a little bit of background on who LiquidX is. Um, LiquidX was founded um, years back and um, really started on the monetization side. So really doing uh, receivables financing. Um, we have two products today, uh, Inblock and LiquidX 360. Inblock is our what we call our digital asset servicing platform. So it was really built um, aimed at, at the corporate space initially uh, to really automate the order to cash and invoice to pay process for corporates um, using distributed ledger technology to trace the invoice, the purchase order, associated documents, contracts, policies. Um, and has evolved over time. We'll take you through a use case um, on that um, outside of the corporate space as well. Uh, LiquidX 360 um, was started as a, a place to sell your invoices and has evolved. We do not only the AR sale, but supply chain finance, trade credit insurance, as Todd mentioned. And so that's really our platform for really financing traditional illiquid assets. And so the two work hand in hand with one another um, and provide real benefits to the um, funders. So asset managers, banks, um, on liquidity, on financing, as well as to the corporates um, on actually funding those uh, working capital plays. So we like to use this slide to kind of explain our business a bit. Um, if you think about the trade finance space and the ecosystem, it really starts on the left-hand side of this page. So 
um, how, you know, where does the asset arise? It, it could be the purchase order, it could be the invoice, um, the associated um, artifacts around that, the bill of lading, shipping notification. So it's really around the how on how assets arrive and how they're linked together. Um, one of the challenges, and we'll talk a little bit about this, is that a lot of times these assets are manual in nature, right? So there are physical documents, um, you know, bill of ladings have complicated stamps, signatures on them. Um, even when they're digitized, sometimes people say they're digitized, they think of digitization as a PDF, which is still a physical form of a, a document in many cases. And so we're really about automating and linking um, the asset process, so digitizing the asset, getting that into a workflow, connecting the data on the left-hand side of the page. And then on the right-hand side is where we monetize that, and we offer these different products that allow you know, the corporate treasurer, um, the AR, AP leader to actually finance those assets. So whether they're selling those invoices, um, whether they're um, participating as a supplier in a supply chain finance program to again, monetize those assets, or they're insuring those assets, those invoices. Um, we also have, um, for our funders, we also have, the ability to actually distribute those assets. And this will be important as you think about the benefits of the distributed ledger technology. Um, a lot of times the banks will purchase an invoice and then they'll distribute that to other banks. And that traceability on the asset is very important as you think about the applicability of Hyperledger. Todd, feel free to add if you have anything you wanna add into. So let's talk a little bit about, oh, sorry, Ted, did you wanna say something? Yeah, one, if you could go back first and really quick, you know, one of the things I was just going to mention here and, you know, you, the audience has probably have seen this. There's a lot of uh, fintechs and insurtechs out there that are very siloed in their approach, right? When you look at what Kristen just described, we've tried to bring the entire ecosystem or what we call the wing to wing um, together to basically give the corporate treasurer, the bank, you know, whoever that constituent may be, the entire a solution at their fingertips uh, for working capital trade finance insurances, you know, and, and so on and so forth. And really leveraging that DLT, the blockchain and that traceability aspect that, you know, we're going to touch on more today. Perfect. So um, when I think about kind of my prior life um, in the corporate space, running payments, let's say for GE, um, one of the challenges I had a lot of the time is we would have automation, but it would only be for a percentage of the process. Um, and we see this with our client base. A large portion of our clients, they just struggle with some of the basics around um, digitizing, truly digitizing um, an invoice, a purchase order, linking that to to each other. So, you know, the purchase order and the invoice don't always work independent of one another, right? They're linked. A lot of times there's limits enforced through purchase order. Um, and when you go to actually finance those, you finance the invoice or the asset, the bank, the funder, the asset manager wants to see the history on that asset as well. And then you have to pull together all this physical documentation connected to each other. So a big part of InBlock, um, aside from blockchain is the fact that we actually do a lot of the digitization and automation, right? So um, what we've done is, is we've used um, a machine learning and AI to automate um, and digitize uh, those artifacts. So an invoice is coming in in a PDF form and then the OCR technology for scraping that. And what that does is it allows us to place that um, you know, physical asset into a digital form. So now it's data or code. And once it's in that form, then we can do so much more with it across our ecosystem. Um, as Todd said, the wing to wing is kind of our, our big opportunity for transforming the space and connecting with other providers to make sure we have this massive ecosystem. So once we get that asset digitized, we then do a verification. So as many of you know, in the trade finance space, there is um, elements of fraud, right? So we can do duplication checks. We can start to connect, right? And verify the connectivity of that asset to other documents. So think about the bill of lading document. We can connect that invoice to the bill of lading. On that bill of lading, a lot of time is, is a shipping vessel, right? We can do a validation of that shipping vessel. Um, and then we connect it, right? So once it's been verified, digitized, transformed, verified, then we connect that asset across the ecosystem. And so we can start to then apply our algorithms on whether 
that asset is available for financing, right? So is it connected and available to be um, financed on the 360 platform? Can it participate in other program? Does it have to be um, a confirmed payable? So does it have to be sent to a buyer to actually approve that invoice um, and go through that workflow before it could be monetized? Um, Todd will talk about the use case around trade credit insurance later as well. And so the same workflow can be used across. The great part too is it's scalable so that it's not just about an invoice and kind of digitizing the invoice, but that same algorithm can apply to any asset class that serves, you know, whether in a physical or digital form. One of the things then we, we do is we get that into the workflow. So as I mentioned earlier, this was, um, you know, the invoice doesn't kind of reside independent in the trade finance space. Um, of invoices, either part of a procure to pay or order to cash process, most likely, right? So um, a supplier might be invoicing their buyer, um, digitizing that invoice, sending it to the buyer, getting the three-way match done when the goods are received, and then the approval from the buyer and the payment. Um, it could be the reverse side where the buyer is in and wanting to originate digital secure assets as well. And so once we've digitized that invoice and we can do it through that front end that I talked about or through APIs with the ERPs, you can then get this digital form of the asset into a workflow, right? And so in this example, um, it could be an inventory report, right? It could be part of an inventory finance deal that needs to be linked to the purchase order and invoice. Um, and so this is kind of the importance as we start to think about the applicability of blockchain and the distributed ledger technology. In the traditional corporate space, a lot of times every corporate is looking at their own ERP. And those corporates also have multi ERPs in many cases, or some don't even have an ERP. And so the, what the distributed ledger technology allows is that traceability and that shared visibility across the asset. Um, so in an inventory finance deal, for example, there could be up to eight participants as part of that. You have the buyer, the supplier, the funder, the warehouse manager, a lot of times there are servicers. And so what becomes hard is that everybody has their own source of truth in their ERP or their tracking system. And what um, this solution allows is that centralized visibility that's enabled through the blockchain technology. So I wanted to talk um, about a practical use case. And once I get through this, as Todd's kind of talking about, I'll look at the chat because I see some questions have come in. Andrea, maybe after Todd's done, we can grab some of those. Um, so if we think about the trade credit insurance yeah. use case, um, so okay. there's two kind of, go ahead, Andrea, sorry. No, oh, I was just saying, okay, if I see okay. some question popping up, I'll go through this. Perfect. Um, so if I think about trade credit insurance, trade credit insurance, there's kind of two forms of an asset that we need to think about um, starting with, right? So you've got the credit insurance policy and invoices. Um, we could be receiving invoices through an API with an ERP. We could also have the physical form like I show here of an invoice that has come in in a PDF and in many cases has to be rekeyed into a system or can go through an OCR scraper that has you know, a mild effectiveness. So we will ingest the policy, which is structured and unstructured data. We'll ingest the invoices. We will digitize both of those. So turning the credit insurance policy into a smart contract, digitizing the invoice into data or code and running that verification. The next piece is that we'll do the connectivity across, right? So we'll start to connect the invoices, let's say to a purchase order on file. We'll look at the history on that purchase order. We'll look at other connected documents that are stored in the in-block vault. Um, and then in parallel, we'll start to validate. So we're gonna look for duplicates. Is this a new policy? Is this an existing policy? Is this an update to a policy? The same thing for the invoices. Is this just a state change to an invoice? It's moved from approved to pending receipt. Is it kind of issued, right? and we'll do the verification on that. And then we'll define the linkage between the two. And that's the kind of sweet spot that we're trying to get to, which is let's get the policy in. A lot of times it's a physical multi-page document with structured and unstructured data. Let's get the invoices in that could, could traditionally come in through a hybrid of means. 
and then let's connect those. And Todd's going to talk about the business use case behind that on the impact and the savings that comes with kind of linking the policy and the invoice together. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Kristen touched on a few very important points. Right now, the way policies work, you have the insurance policy here and you have the invoices over here, right? And they're very separate because they're, they're not even on the same system. Typically, insurance policies are not on the system at all. It's a very static analog paper contract that you either put on your desk or put on a shelf. The interesting thing about that is that insurance policy, when we're looking at trade credit insurance, ensures those invoices that you as a corporate have sold and that is due to you, or if you're a banker that you've lent against or have purchased under a receivable purchase program. So what we, you know, going back to what Kristen was saying by us not only digitizing, but basically bringing those two assets as we call them together, gives that traceability, visibility, understanding of basically will this or, or greater comfort of will this policy perform? do I have contract certainty? Because like what we have today, and this is a, you know, if you it, please refer to the table on the, on the right. <clears throat> when you look at how credit insurance is, is transacted today, it's highly analog, it's incredibly manual. And really, if you think about it, resource intensive and error, human error prone, right? When you have resource intensive, manual, processes, something might get entered wrong. Something might be input to wrong. Someone might be on vacation that, you know, forces a, a breach of a threshold that is uh, required under the policy. So when we look at this, we say, okay, how can we digitize everything from the request of quote down through a, a claim, filing a claim? And this is what we basically have addressed with our in-block digital policy management system and our overall in um, trade credit insurance digital portal. So like when I, when I came to LiquidX, there was a lot of talk about where is the future going? Where is this industry going? And a lot of the participants, and this could be brokers, the banks, the insurance carriers at pretty high levels, they do really believe that anywhere between 50, uh, 30 on the low end, upwards of 50% of my industry, of our industry, will be either originated, managed, and transacted online. And why is that? It's because of what I just mentioned, right? Like these analog modes of dialogue and communication, manual processes, they just can't keep up with the new pace of trade transactions, right? And once you digitize, all of these, all of these aspects of a trade credit insurance program, the entire ecosystem gets tra greater transparency, which is very, very well lacking today. But also, they're able to put into smarter processes, right? And it goes back to that contract certainty, confidence that their policy will perform. And like when you look at getting an, insur an insurance policy, right? You have, you reach out to your representative, you reach out to the insurance company or a broker, a lot of back and forth with emails, phone calls, PDFs, and then you bind, right? And that alone takes probably around four to six weeks. If, you know, if people on the line have purchased, it's probably a four to, four to six week process. But then the management of the policy is actually the most important part, right? And that that's where the reporting requirements come in. That's where you have to make sure that the buyer is eligible. That's where you need to confirm the authenticity, authenticity of the buyer. Just basically ensuring that everything that is supposed to happen under the policy is happening. But unfortunately, a lot of people do not have that visibility under that because everything's done um, very um, in different silos, right? You have you have your working capital systems here, you have your treasury management systems over here, AP, AR systems over here. A lot of times they do interconnect, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they're a little bit disconnected or disjointed. And then the policy sitting over by itself, you know, waiting for the actions to be taken based on what the terms and conditions say, right? So 
when we take everything and digitize that entire process, a lot of those question marks go away, right? So, in, and I'm gonna get into that a little bit more um, in the next slide, Chris, and if you could just go to the next slide. When you think about digitization of credit insurance, we view it through these three pillars. And all of these pillars are really based on underlying risk management principles. Earlier today, I shared with you my background. I basically worked for insurers um, my entire career, right? So like when we were building this out, I thought to myself, risk, risk, risk. How can we mitigate this risk? Because insurance is a risk mitigation tool. And that's kind of how I'm, I'm kind of geared. So when you look today, right, you'll like that middle pillar, credit insurance online, you know, we basically developed the first online uh, platform for trade credit insurance around, uh, in 2018, around three years ago. Um, what you've seen uh, of late is a handful of other uh, companies come on and basically launch platforms in different geographic regions globally. And I, I tell you, that's great. That's a first great step. You know what I mean? Because like right now, as I showed before, man along, time delay, just, just very inefficient way of sourcing and binding capacity. But in my view, and in our view here at Liquid X, that's really part of the equation, right? Because it's one thing to buy credit insurance and source that capacity you need online. But if you can't, if you don't digitize and automate those processes, what does that coverage mean if the policy doesn't perform, right? So we view it as that first and most important step in block digital policy management. So what does that mean? Converting that policy into a smart contract. And since we already have the invoices digitized as well um, through InBlock, as Kristen mentioned, they can now talk together. We have two smart contracts talking together because each basically turn into a line of code. So you, you go from a, and I always say this and I, and I feel odd saying it, but an insurance policy as it stands today is a piece of paper, it's static and somewhat dumb because it, it doesn't interact with anybody. Once it's smart, now it starts interacting. And once that policy starts talking, this is where the benefits come in, right? We could verify the receivables are eligible based on the terms and conditions of the policy, invoicing period, terms of payment, amongst other um, type of um, parameters. But also we could confirm better authenticity. And what does that mean? So a lot of times what you'll see is you might be uh, selling or if you're a bank buying the AR of ABC Corp, 100 Main Street, Peoria, Illinois, Duns number one, two, three, four, five. But on the policy, is ABC Inc. same number, different DUNS number, separate legal entity. That's actually a breach of the credit insurance policy for most carriers, right? So we could also confirm that authenticity and eligibility of that particular debtor. But it's also tracking the, the, the performance of the assets. And when I say the asset, I mean the invoices, right? Are they paying properly? Are they going through? Um, is there a past due situation occurring, right? Because in most trade, in all trade credit insurance policies, there's a very strict rule that within a certain time frame, after the original due date, a report is required to the carrier, right? And when you think of like, um, you know, my industry has gotten a lot of, um, let's say, negativity surrounding it because they're like, oh, ins well, actually, probably all insurance, right? Insurance doesn't want to pay. Um, you're going to find a way not to pay the claim. Um, and, and I understand some of those, some of that feedback, right? But when I actually talk to a lot of the people within my world, my former employers, the head of claims and whatnot, upwards of 85%, if not more, of denied claims are due to human error. And really what drives that human error, number one, the endorsed terms of payment, on the actual invoice were greater than the endorsed terms of payment on the policy. That's the human error. Number two, the legal entity insured under the policy was different than the legal entity that was actually being sold to. 
again, oversight, human error. Last but not least, the claims or re past due reporting threshold of the, of the policy was breached. So again, that, that could be as simple as just forgetting someone's on vacation, someone's on sick, someone had a family emergency and that breached. And then when you get back, you kind of forget what's going on. And then 10, 15 days later, you finally come around to it. That's a very strict term and condition of that policy, which would lead to a claim denial. So if you really think about it, you know, and if you look into 2020, most of the trade credit insurance carriers had loss ratios at the low end, 80, 90%, upwards of 125%. During the credit crisis, was, I think the lowest was about 125, 125% loss ratio. So the industry pays the claims. However, there are conditions under those policies that have to be met. And what we've done with our in-block in, in digital policy management module and service, we basically automated all, all of those manual processes to mitigate that operational risk, give contract certainty, and give everyone in the, all the constituents more confidence that policy will actually perform. Credit insurance online, the second pillar. We already touched on this, but really this is for new, new policies. If, if you're a large purchaser of credit insurance, you can launch new, new policies through the platform. And what's nice there, if you have, a, let's say pre-agreed wordings with your different carriers, with your insurance panel, they're already a part of the portal. So once you add, a, or let's say you go out and get a new policy, everything's there for you and your broker basically to put together right there, right there and then. And it gives you a much more efficient way to actually go out and get insurance, right? Working together with your broker, instead of waiting back and forth and getting the emails and you know your broker basically then gets you know, 10, 15 different responses from all the carriers. And one of the things we do want to do or what we don't want to do, I, I guess I should say, as a... Um, as an industry itself is to piecemeal back information to you. So some underwriters come back really quick and say, okay, yes, I could do this, or I, I could do this quote at this price, or I declined it. But we don't wanna just basically give that to you. We want to aggregate all of that information. So we get it through emails today, right? And then as the broker, we re-enter all that information into a spreadsheet to present to you. That takes about four weeks. Once you go online, you're getting, you and your broker are getting that feedback from the underwriter in real time. So you're seeing who's coming back, who's coming back quick, who's a laggard, what these results look like. And then for your broker, they're also then be able, instead of doing a lot of data entry, adding that higher value uh, work for you and you know talking to the insurance company to help on pricing or to get more coverage or you know, work on the wording that might, you know, if it's a new, new program where you don't have a coverage with that particular underwriter, work on wording that needs to get done instead of basically doing a lot of that data entry. Last but not least, we kind of bring it all together in our position or risk monitor. What this does is basically, and this is really more for insurance brokers, banks, large corporates with multiple policies. A, 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 a more than just one policy, but we bring the entire portfolio under one umbrella, right? Regardless of the broker, regardless of ge uh, geography, um, regardless of types of policies, right? So in, what I mean by that is like, when you look at a bank portfolio, sometimes they're, they're the named insured through like, let's say a receivable purchase program or a supply chain finance program. And sometimes they're co-insured with, the originator, as well as uh, them standing side by side on the policy. And sometimes, depending on the bank, they're lost payee. And we've talked, we've heard a lot about lost payee situations in the news recently, uh, given um, the, 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 the Green Hill situation. I'm not necessarily talking like that. I'm talking more along the lines of there's a tremendous amount of like the day to day commercial banks out there that lend on receivables that are insured. Right, so it's 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 more of a credit facility borrowing base um, structure where insurance is there, just there to give added um, comfort to the bank and added security to the bank. Now, with that, a lot of times the banks don't have any visibility into what's going on there, 
And they don't even know sometimes that, you know, at the top level, yes, the local offices might understand and know the policies in place, but no one at senior management level knows. So you don't, you're not getting that holistic view of the insurance that might be placed or the aggregation of the insurers that are being used across those three different subsets of um, policies, you know, named insured, joint insured, or lost payee. So what we do here, we give that 360 degree access of insurance. You're able to slice and dice basically anything you want from the highest level to the lowest level, you know, highest, the most macro to the most granular level to see how that poly, uh, how that performance and how that portfolio is, um, you know, performing. But also like if you do use multiple brokers or, you know, on the lost payee, like you're not really, you don't have access to many of those brokers, but, you know, those policyholders, we could basically entitle whoever that you would want to have access to certain policies that's both internally and externally to help manage those programs. So the position risk monitor is basically what brings everything together that gives you basically unpre that unprecedented insight, but also that transparency and traceability that's really elusive in the market today. So Todd, one question that came in maybe while you're talking about this is, you know, is the visibility just to the policy owner or is it also to the funder? I know you touched a little bit upon it, but I just wanted to kind of raise the question. Maybe you can touch on that briefly. No, absolutely. Thanks, Kristen. And that's a great question because, you know, the way we look at it, right, what, what stakeholder or constituent does the insured want or want to grant access to, to their policy. Typically it's their lender, it's the bank, their insurance broker or agent. It's really up to you to basically tell us who gets access, right? And that's a great question because like on the bank side, right? There's some banks that use three, four five different brokers. There's even some corporates that do the same thing based on different geogra uh, geographical locations. So where the bank or the corporate's getting a lot of information and really disparate in like, you know, inconsistent manners, right? And even um, structures, we could bring it under that one umbrella, give you the visibility you need as the insured parties, right? But if it's broker A having, you know, five policies in North America, broker B managing, let's say 10 in the UK, so on and so forth, we then position uh, permission and entitle those particular stakeholders for access and view to those programs. Now we go a step further. You might want to allow the brokers to do everything on your behalf, or you might want the brokers just to have view access. Totally up to you. Our system, our entitlement foundation and infrastructure is built on, you tell us who gets what access, and how much access they get to be able to read, write, view only, or make decisions or you know, prompt action upon your behalf. Perfect, thanks Todd. The um, other question that came in just on um, insurance was around kind of multi-jurisdiction and kind of how do you handle that today? Um, you know, if the buyer and seller sit across different jurisdictions and then using smart contract technology um, to kind of manage this process and maybe kind of two cents on my side from a more technical perspective, you can talk to the more business side, but um, you know, when we think about in block and the digitization and the use of smart contracts, um, you know, to me, the, the distributed ledger technology it's just one portion of the broader solution. So in many ways, we've overcompensated with business logic as well that enforces configurable workflows that allow you to get kind of physical um, and digital approvals on assets, um, store comments, have traceability on where those assets originate from. Um, we hope over time um, that some of the business logic we've had to place on top of kind of the rest of the infrastructure um, will be lessened as we automate and get more comfortable as a global economy around um, the technology. But we have, you know, just to be transparent, we have overcompensated with some of the business code on the front end to kind of accommodate some of those concerns that were raised in the chat. 
Um, Todd, anything you want to add to that? I don't know if there was anything else you wanted to add to that. Yeah, absolutely. So when you look at trade credit insurance, right, let's, let's view this as, I know this is a, a global audience. Um, when I say U United States, just, you know, kind of put yourself into, you know, your country. Um, while there's a lot of domestic, let's say U.S.-based policies, whereas U.S. to U.S. or Italy to Italy or so on and so forth, a lot of trade credit insurance, and I would say probably a large majority of the trade credit insurance, at least 50%, if not more, um, is for cross-border transactions, right? So what we do there and how we help, let's say, confirm that uh, authenticity of the debtor is hook up with a third party information source like a Dun, Dun & Bradstreet, like a um, what used Veritas, but that Kofos bought Veritas for Latin America, um, Burrow Dan, um, Van Dyke. So a third party company that basically helps verify. And so we have the, these unique identifiers to ensure that everything is basically copacetic within that policy, right? Because the last thing you wanna do is buy an insurance policy, you request a name, then you find out after the fact that it's the wrong name that you actually um, that you actually insured, even though it's part of the same corporate family, right? So I think it's very important for all parties, if it's the bank, if it's the insured party, the broker, you know, really does a you know do, does a deep dive to ensure that that account debtor is the right account debtor because that that is unfortunately you know one of those three reasons that you know get a claim kicked out. And without like reconfirming via a DUNS or another uh, third party entity, and then tying those invoices together with the policy to ensure that traceability, that auditability, that, that, that's really where a lot of that, let's say rubber hits the road. Awesome. So maybe, um just having gone through a few of the chat questions, um, another one that came up um, just to kind of talk about what we're talking about insurance is, um, you know, what happens if the digitization goes wrong on the invoice, right? And there's a mismatch or an issue or missing information. Um, one of the things I mentioned previously is that we have overcompensated with some business logic on the front end. So as assets are ingested, so if we take, take the example of the invoice, as the invoice is ingested, so the user clicks browse, upload, um, that invoice is then digitally scraped, it's then presented back to the user um, for confirmation. And those workflows are configurable um, because we use machine learning. So over time, we start to realize, let's say the invoice is digitally scraped and loaded and um, there's a missing piece of information on the invoice that's actually required um, by the insurer, right? Um, the user can then enter that and we store those user actions as well and the approvals um, against that. Because we use um, machine learning, we can then prompt the next time we see that same pattern detected um, in the next time that invoice is uploaded, um, the system starts to learn can prompt the user. And so we do overcompensate a bit with some of the business logic to actually provide that extra comfort, right, for the funders, the insurers, that the data that we're ingesting is accurate by using the human. Our goal over time is eventually to eliminate some of those human actions, right? And that's where the process starts to scale and automate and um, maybe use an example um, that we see in the corporate space. Um, we have a reconciliation engine, right? Um, in most corporates and in a lot of the banks today, uh, back offices are matching the invoice, the payment and the remittance advice for AR reconciliation. So. You know, if they're a funder that's doing supply chain finance and they're funding those assets, they're having to do that back office reconciliation. If they're on the corporate side and they're in the AR um, function, they're doing that matching. Um, many of our clients come to us and they start with doing that matching on Excel spreadsheets. And then we introduce um, our in-match engine that does a reconciliation. And the first question we get a lot of the times is, how can I trust that the system is doing this properly, right? So whether it's the ingestion and digitization of those assets, or the invoice, the remittance advice, the payments, um, 
and the workflow. And so what we've seen over time is this aha moment as we kind of use the workflow to allow the user to have control over the digitization. So they're able to review every asset that's digitized and eventually they begin to trust it because they realize that there's no action they have to take against that asset over time. Um, and then they start to actually spend their time on the insights around it. So, you know, it's interesting that client, that customer is always taking a, a deduction or they're taking a discount out of an allowable range that's defined in our master services agreement. And so I think the same holds true across the whole ecosystem and trade finances. You know, you have to kind of take a, a plunge in and, and do this digitization effort, um, but you have to have that cautious workflow um, capability to actually protect the end user and the participants up until the point they feel comfortable and confident around the technology working. Um, so hopefully it's a long answer to a question, but it was a great question because we hear it a lot with our clients as well. Yeah, yeah, Kristen, I just want to ask you something, if that's okay. Sure. <laughs> um, there's this one, the um, one question, and maybe this is one that you you addressed. We're talking about funding bank digitization regarding trade credit insurance, but I think that this is across the board, and I have my view, but I would like to get your view as well. What if if some of the information is inaccurate or missing, and what legal risks? Now, Kristen and I are both not attorneys, but you know. <laughs> Right. But so, but one of the things like, like, again, I have my view, but I would like to get your view, Kristen, in terms of like, sure. when we talk about automation, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's no human oversight, right? It's, exactly. And yeah. so that's why we've built this workflow that kind of overcompensates. But to me, the, the human risk element is no different whether the asset's been digitized or actually it's worse when the user is doing that through their eyes outside of a system so it's less visible. So, um, you know, we've kind of prevented that in some ways or at least um, de-risk the scenario, the question that was raised by allowing um, this workflow that allows you to capture those changes. So if Todd Linity made a change to the invoice, it's logged, right? And it can be approved, right? If you wanna configure it for multiple approvals every time an invoice is changed. Um, if a value has been scraped, it'll be flagged in the digitization engine and, and presented to the user. So um, the risk kind of shifts a bit. Instead of the risk being the person kind of fat fingering and keying in the wrong information as they digitize, and, and I use digitize loosely, as they um, transcribe the values from an invoice over into you know, a digital form, um, now the risk is around the user reviewing and identifying items that don't look right. Um, and to me, it's a lower risk than kind of the rekeying of information. But that's the Kristen Michaud opinion. So, yeah. You know, you know, Kristen, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Kristen, because seriously, like that was my opinion. Like that's what I was going to say as well. Right. When you look at a policy and we do this right now, right, we'll digitize a policy and we digitize those terms and conditions. And we do a review, right? But at the end of the day, right, the broker, the bank, the corporate, like who's ever like basically digitizing it should also review it as well, right? Now, when you look at the digitization and the automation, uh, automation of those day-to-day -day policy management, right, the reporting requirements and everything else, you know, what we're doing there is prompting a lot of action, right? There's it, like, we're not, because let's use an example for a past due report. Um, I've seen some of the trade credit insurance people and users on uh, in, the, in the audience. So basically once an account is a certain day past due, it has to get sent to the underwriter, right? With that typically comes a little story, right? Sometimes it is a, what we call simple past due where we're waiting for a credit or, there is a small dispute on a partial invoice. So once this gets taken care of, everything's gonna be fine. The underwriter's not gonna view that as anything bad. It's just the normal course of business. Now, if let's say for instance, that everything was automated and that past due just went to the underwriter with none of that backstory, none of that context of what's going on, that could be incredibly harmful, not just for that insured party, but also globally, because a lot of the underwriters, once they see a past due, a legitimate past due that is of size, the underwriters start, you know, circling the wag and they say, okay, what's going on with this particular account debtor? What is going on with this buyer? So going back to what, the, what Kristen said, the risk does 
just basically transfer a little bit to I'm doing everything manually. I'm looking at this, you know, sh spreadsheet or aging or invoice report that has thousands and thousands of lines to initially let's set this policy up. Okay, everything looks good, right? Get that second, third set of eyes just to make sure. Once that's done, a lot of other stuff falls into place. And then it's just a matter of overseeing everything that you do anyway. But a lot of that um, low value, let's say at administrative work, that data entry work, or just reviewing, you know, font six in a spreadsheet to ensure that the invoices are, you know, in line and don't have to be report. That's the kind of stuff that's being automated. Perfect. Christine, talk. Uh, yeah. Just, just in, I mean, just a remark for me. I mean, just a thoughts on my side. Uh, is was very good this last part. You know, you were saying, we, we talk often at our C in the past how digitization happens, the handling of documents between the different stakeholders. And this is pretty good. I mean, what you mentioned, Todd, because you see, how in the digital process, human factor is not scraped at all. It's still in it, but it's in a way it's enhanced in order to prevent any mistakes and inefficiency. And this I think we should point out when talking about digitization in the future, especially in trade finance, uh, if we want to achieve full digitization in the future, so I was uh, kind of asking, since we are here in this city, which is, you know, happy like you say, my feeling is you have chosen to develop your solutions and the happy like protocols. What drove your decision in doing this and how she could fit, in your opinion, in delivering your solution? Yes, we chose Hyperledger for a couple of reasons. Um, for the security aspect of it, right? Um, so we want, you know, most of our clients are either corporates um, and their information is um, proprietary and confidential if you think about the way that they do their business and their um, supply chain um, or funders, right, and insurers. And so um, Hyperledger was a, a means to actually providing um, a scalable technology solution um, in a private ecosystem. Um, we also uh, liked Hyperledger because it was intended for the B2B space, right? And so we feel like it allows that kind of flexibility and adaptability across. Um, it doesn't mean that in the future we won't um, integrate and interoperate with um, networks like Ethereum and others as the use cases come to play, because um, we do believe in the value of the ecosystem and, um, you know, being interoperable with all of um, not only our competitors, but peers as well, right? So. Um, the value that comes for all of us is, is when we find these um, networks that connect to one another. And so that's kind of um, why we chose Hyperledger and, you know, has it paid off? Um, absolutely. I, I don't think we could be um, any happier with the decision that we made. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it's just a component of our overall solution. So I think if we um, didn't have kind of the other leading technology components um, as part of Inblock and, and the 360 um, platform, um, this wouldn't be as scalable from a wing to wing perspective. So, um, you know, the, the distributed ledger technology plays its role in this. Um, machine learning AI plays its role. Our flexible configurable workflows play another role in this broader ecosystem, if that makes sense, Andrea. Uh, Christine, uh, it does make sense a lot to me. Uh, you mentioned about scalability. Uh, we're talking about insurance policies. Uh, can this scale uh, beyond an asset class, in your opinion? What's your opinion into this? How do you see this in the future? I mean, Absolutely. Uh, insurance policies within a trade and trade funds based picture for the non professionals. I mean, play a huge role in international exchanges and are bound to step in even more and more and more uh, because the reasons that we know it's next to that asset. So, I mean, what about scalability for future on a DLT-based picture? 
I think there's two pieces of it. I think there's this volume-based scalability, um, which we've seen the performance work really well with Hyperledger. Um, you know, most of our clients process anywhere between 250,000 invoices a year and a million invoices a year, right? Um, so it's it's normal for us to receive files of 100,000 invoices at a time and have to ingest that, whether we're digitizing it, ingesting it, and then pushing that out into our workflow. And so, um, you know, we're very happy with the kind of volume-based scalability. Um, and then the other side of that is, is you know, um, you know, digitizing an invoice and digitizing a purchase order and digitizing a warehouse report for. Um, for inventory and connecting that data and enforcing smart contracts where there's um, policies and, and automation are all kind of the same types of behavior. So the bet we're making is that over time we can continue to introduce new asset classes, right? And um, every time we're out working with our clients, they come up with a new one, right? So, you know, we don't do letters of credit today. That's one that, um, you know, we've been asked to do, right? Um, master services agreements with the corporate. So if you can digitize an insurance policy and link that to the invoice, why can't you digitize a master services agreement and enforce um, those rules across a purchase order and invoice? Absolutely, right? It's the same technology that can be scaled across multiple asset types. Uh, absolutely. Uh, any of you, Christina or Todd, just to question about, you know, when you deal with digitization, data, security, uh, you know, on my perspective, coming from a very traditional industry in a very traditional milieu and a very traditional uh, setup, I guess you, you told, you, I deal with corporate, with banks, insurers, brokers. How do you see them dealing with the data safeness, with data security? What's the current attitude towards technology in terms of security? How do they feel about this? Is the attitude, general attitude, changing? It's improving? Is it stable? How do you see this evolving? Yeah, I think data security is at the forefront and will always continue to be. Um, we have kind of the highest InfoSec reviews and ratings. Um, we are a Broadridge-backed company. Um, so we, and many of the major banks are our clients. So we do have to um, raise to those standards and meet those standards um, for InfoSec reviews. So, um, you know, it's important to them from a regulatory perspective, but it's important to us in general because our whole premise is that, um, you know, you really automate and digitize this process through connected data. And if you can't secure your data, then what's the point, right? And so, um, I don't know, Todd, if you think differently, but um, to me, this is the question we get that's at the front of every discussion. And um, that's why we spend so much of our time making sure we're protecting that data as well for our clients. Yeah, yeah I agree 100%, Kristen, because whenever I speak on the insurance side, you know, a lot of the insurers are either, even if they're a standalone, like an Atreides or Yielder, they're owned by larger organizations like Yielder with Allianz. But then you have AIG, like you're dealing with these like multinational organizations that are um, prone to cyber. Um, you know, and just like the, this information is their data, right? And they, they want to ensure that it's safe and it's kept safe. But not only those entities, like there's also like a great, like a huge um, uh, group of brokers in my space that are, um, you know, they, they basically built up their business from the ground up over the last 10, 15, 20 years. And like, this is their data. It's incredibly important. And as Kristen mentioned, like information security and InfoSec is, I would say, one of the first things that come to mind when I think of LiquidX because of that broad rich backing. And I would say it's one of our competitive advantages because a lot of fintechs out there um, probably, and this is an assumption on my part, but I'm just going on what I've seen from my old jobs and then where I am today. Um, do not go through the rigorous InfoSec protocols and like we're in the middle of our, our SOX audit and the fact that Broadridge basically, you know, we follow those protocols and their processes. I, I think that's a huge competitive advantage for us because I don't see a lot of other entities that are within, let's say, our peer group going through those levels of, um, let's say, pain, to put it mildly. <laughs> But it's important, very important. Yeah. Uh, we 
We're approaching the end of the meeting, actually. So I will leave it on the attendance in case of any other questions from, from their side. And Andre, if anyone has questions afterwards, um, if they send it to you, you can send it to us and Chris and I will be more than happy to address anything that people have. Yeah, as usually it will be fine to have a recap between the three of us, see what we can deliver. It's constant dialogue that we can put in place, of course, on this end of the world. You just mentioned a few things that which I do treasure a lot. I mean, it's complexity and sometimes cumbersomeness of the of the processes, the slow motion from time to time. I, 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 for me, trade insurance was a huge pro product in my daily life and see with customers I used to deal with. So basically the basic pain point that I faced was slow, 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 slow on the traditional side. But as the whole of the industry, is so slow. So very first uh, thought of my opinion was we deal, you mentioned you deal with data and data patterns uh, that leave a mark on the business world. Uh, I think my feeling is this technology can help not only on the operational side, but also on the formation side. Uh, you often deal you, with customers that you know very little or recurring ones. I have, when I got my own customers in the face during this additional stage, I should know what to tell my customer. Is it insurable? Isn't it insurable? Uh, how much can I grant in terms of percentage of fees, which indeed are a factor affecting deeply uh, international sales? So this could be potentially an instrument that could massively help making things run much, much smoother, much quicker way. Yeah, so you highlighted a few good points, you know, when you put question marks in there. You know, that, that's what visibility also is. Nowadays, in traditional process, you don't know where you are, what stages, you have gone through, which sometimes leaves you in a dark place. So you have the means to light this up and see, hey, we went through the step, the step, the step. Now we have that step to go through. This is a totally different, uh, not different actually, a harmonized and enhanced process. Oh, absolutely. And, and I think that uh, with that information, you know, depending on who, you know, who, what stakeholders involved, they could start really capturing a lot of great data that could help inform future business decisions, help with resource allocation. If you're a broker, understanding propensities to buy where people are putting their efforts and really start even looking out at, you know, churn and, you know, uh, portfolio retention, right? Like who's re Who's, in, um, who's renewing, who's not, who's buying, who's not. So like, depending on what lens you look through, um, there's a lot to be gathered by basically bringing all this information together on, you know, harmonized and, and bring it onto one portal because right now it's very disparate and a lot of great information is not being captured. Oh, Christine, uh, we're coming to an end. It's just now we're going by right now. Uh, I have to rush. I'm so sorry. I will stay here for more than one hour, simply. But it, let's keep the line well open between us. I mean, I'm glad to go deeper into this. It's it's great stuff. I mean, your solution is so so interesting. So thanks for being with us today. It was a really interesting yeah. meeting. And I thank both of you. Thank the attendants for being with us today. And hope to see you again in the future, showing up at our meetings. Thank you very thank much you, for having Margaret. us. Thank, thank you, Andre. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.